all feel patriotic now, don't we? <laughs> um, two quick things. I don't see any little people here today, any, young, any youngsters. But um, if you're planning to bring a grandchild or a neighbor's child with you, there are now permission slips on back on the round table in the narthex uh, to allow us to use your child's or your grandchild's image while we're live streaming. So um, for those who um, might know of someone who brings a child, please keep that in mind. And I know we have visitors today, so one more time, folks, one more time. This is our communion. I hope everybody has received a cup on their way in. If not, please raise your hand and we'll get them to you. Okay, there we got some. Okay, Bob is gonna bring them around. Um, and when it's time for communion, there are two pieces to this. The first one is a clear little plastic. If you haven't used it before, it's a little clear plastic. You pull it back and underneath that clear plastic is the host, which you will then receive. Did you get, do you need one, sir? Okay, um, then you'll receive that host when I say this is the body of Christ given for you. Then carefully point it away from you. You will peel the second piece back just like a creamer at the deli. Carefully, don't squeeze it or you'll be wearing uh, the blood of Christ, which is probably stains. Um, so then when that's when I say this is the body of the blood of Christ shed for you, you will take the wine. So again, we seem to go through that every week, but that's okay. Practice makes perfect. So now as we prepare to worship, let us rise as we are able to confess our sins and acknowledge God's forgiveness. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of mana, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy, you are forgiven and loved into abundant life.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In our baptism, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles, that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Today's readings are for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. The first reading is a reading from the second chapter of Ezekiel. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. They shall know that there has been a prophet among them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is a reading from the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could not do deeds of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Sit down. <laughs> Almost. Uh, there are no children here, but I think this is a message that would be beneficial to all of us. And so we're going to go ahead and do the children's message. So just put on your kindergarten caps and think of yourself as children. So today is what day? It's a special day, right? Now you have to be children and answer me. So what is today? Fourth of July. What does that stand for? Independence, Independence from whom? from England, right? That was a long time ago, right? But we still celebrate it every year. And so as part of that celebration, I know we have a flag over there. You see the American flag? It's not the one that was around in the, 18, in the 1700s. We've added states, but the 13 stripes are there for the colonies. So we're going to now raise our, our, our allegiance to that flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And because I think probably some of you haven't had to recite that for a while, I took the liberty of printing it in the bulletin in case your mind might get a little foggy. Okay, so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated now. 
So we say that, and in spite of what you see on Facebook, it is said every day in the classrooms across this country. I know I have several people in my family who are teachers, and they begin that every day with the Pledge of Allegiance. So that Pledge of Allegiance that we say, the children say, we should probably think of it more often ourselves as adults, but what, that is how we pledge our allegiance. Now, I was gonna have to explain allegiance to the children, but I don't think I need to explain it to you. So that's how we pledge our allegiance to the company, to the country that we are part of, the country that is free from, from, uh, from overpowering people who make us do things that we might not wanna do. We have freedom, and so we pledge allegiance to that freedom. And we remind ourselves, and we, we remind the children every week when they say that, every day when they say that. And they say it at camps, and they say it um, various times, and uh, it's important for us to remember. Now I'm gonna ask you to stand one more time as you're able. And in your bulletin, you will see right underneath that is the Apostles' Creed. And so now we will recite and profess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So you notice, that is another way that we pledge our allegiance. Only this time, instead of to a country, we pre pledge our allegiance to Jesus Christ and to the faith that we all hold so dear. They are different. They are not to be confused one with the other. The Pledge of Allegiance to the country is one that we all take, no matter what our creed, our religion, our race, whatever, we are all part of that same country, and so we pledge allegiance to it. What we pledge allegiance to in the Apostles' Creed is our faith, and that is our Christian faith. But we do not impose that on anyone else. That is our faith and our pledge, and it is part and parcel of who we are. And so we combine the two, although they are separate. Our founding fathers made church and state separate. And so we do combine the two, and it's important for us to remember that we have allegiance not only to our country, but also to our Christian faith. And that's my little 4th of July message. So thank you for listening. I know you're not in kindergarten or first grade, but I really appreciate you listening anyway. Anybody else warm? Just me, huh? Well, I probably have more clothes on than most of you. <laughs> but summer is certainly upon us. It's not going to be as hot today as it was last week. Last week I was in Atlanta, and guess what? It was like 10 degrees hotter here than it was in Atlanta, so go figure. Anyway, summer is upon us. And I'm wondering, if anyone else is wondering, what happened to June? What happened to June? I can't believe it's July 4th. So are any of you planning uh, to get away for a little break, either this month or maybe next month? I just got back, as I said, from a family reunion in uh, Atlanta on Tuesday, and I will be leaving on Wednesday morning at the crack of dawn for North Carolina uh, for a family baptism. And then at the end of July, I head back to Atlanta. My kids think I'm commuting back and forth to Atlanta this summer but I head back to Atlanta for a family wedding. Phew, it's certainly not the summer that I had planned. But family is important, and it's been so long since we've been able to be together as a family. When these family events uh, popped up on the calendar, I could not resist being together with so many of my family uh, after these long, long quarantine months. But anyone, who's ever planned a, family, a vacation trip around family visits,
probably knows that these excursions aren't always the most relaxing. They can be stressful. I think that sometimes the definition of family is stress. And maybe they don't often rise up to our expectations. There can be anxiety and even arguments. Thanks be to God that that was not my experience in Atlanta last week, and hopefully not in Raleigh next week or Atlanta the end of the month. But I have experienced these disappointing trips, and maybe some of you have too. This morning, our gospel writer Mark tells us a story about when Jesus took his little band of disciples home to meet his family in, Naz in um, Nazareth. You see, Nazareth was his hometown, a little village kind of set on the hill, not known for anything spectacular, kind of a no place for nobodies. It was 15 miles from the Mediterranean. Nazareth was way off the beaten path. In fact, it was so unimportant and so insignificant that when Nathaniel heard from his friend Philip, that the man that Moses and so many of the old-time prophets had written about was this Jesus, this son of Joseph, that he was from this little no-place hamlet called Nazareth. And he asked that famous question, can anything good come from Nazareth? Anything good, indeed. Well, Nazareth, of course, had a synagogue. And Jesus was an alumnus of the synagogue school. His parents still lived there. And although Jesus had left his hometown some time ago to answer the call to proclaim the good news of God, Mark tells us that he was returning home, kind of like a homecoming, to preach and to teach to his family and his friends. Can you picture it? Jesus speaking about welcoming all and forgiving even those who harm you, and sharing even your meager belongings. And Nazareth was an impoverished town, so they didn't have much, but Jesus was urging them to share even their meager belongings with everyone. Imagine him talking about the kingdom of God coming near, proclaiming peace and love even for adversaries and enemies. Well, as you can imagine, it didn't go well. And anyone who's ever been invited to speak at or even listen to anybody speaking at an alumni bank banquet or a company milestone or a church anniversary or any other type of commemoration knows the drill. Keep it on the light side. Share some cute remembrances. And most of all, thank your loyal supporters. Well, Jesus didn't follow that script. He didn't tell them stories about his childhood or about how happy and how proud he was to be home. He didn't share any fond memories of his youth. And he didn't share any thanksgiving with any of his family or his neighbors for their support of his ministry. He told them instead things that made them uncomfortable, made them squirm, things that challenged their comfort zones forced them to look at their lives in new and different ways. He spoke to them as a Hebrew prophet from the old days of Moses and Elijah would have. You see, a Hebrew prophet is not and was not a fortune teller. The Greek root, root of our English word prophet means one who speaks for another. The Hebrew prophet had two goals. The first was to proclaim the word of the Lord, and the second was to bring that word, the impact of that word, to the people. The Hebrew prophet was an integral part of God's mission for all of humanity. The prophet viewed the signs of the times with a God's eye vision, and then he proclaimed the word of the Lord, afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. The first lesson that Bob read to us this morning from Ezekiel illustrates the call and the mission of that Hebrew prophet, who was a, moral, a mortal, and yet filled with the Spirit of God, and then sent to the people of God with God's message. 
More often than not, a prophet was sent to a rebelling and defiant people, as we heard in Ezekiel, challenging them to return to the ways of the Lord, whether these rebellious people listened or not. Ezekiel makes it clear at the end of our passage that they will still know that a prophet had been among them. The onus was then and still is now and always will be on the hearer. Repent! Repent or wind up headed in exactly the way you're going, which is not a good way. The hearers in Ezekiel won't listen to the word of the Lord, but Ezekiel knows that God will never stop trying to be heard. People too, people, those that listen then and those that listen now, may be too frightened to change. The cost of changing their hearts may seem to be simply too much for them. Some may not even hear the word of the Lord clearly enough to make those changes. But God keeps on keeping on. Well, when Jesus spoke, the people of Nazareth took offense. Jesus was one of their own, and yet they simply could not see Jesus as a prophet. The days of the prophets had long ago ended. No prophet had been heard from for centuries. Why would God break that silence now, they wondered, and they wondered it aloud. What new message could God have for the people of Israel? How dare Jesus, how dare he, the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph, call himself a prophet sent from God in the same league as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Elijah and Ezekiel? How could he dare to do that? Well, the people of Nazareth, it seems, were shackled by their own perceptions. The word of the Lord, the word of love and peace and hope, fell on their deaf ears. Their self-understanding as worthless nobodies from a worthless little village like Nazareth didn't allow them to hear the voice of God or to recognize that the man standing in front of them was the Son of God. They could not envision God bringing new possibilities and new power into their lives. And Jesus marveled. Mark said he was amazed at their unbelief. Oh, he healed a few people of their disease in Nazareth. But Mark tells us that he couldn't do mighty works there. Well, their unbelief certainly didn't render the Son of God impotent. Rather, their overwhelming doubt dampened, dampened the effects of even the few healings that Jesus was able to do there. You see, the prophet comes with a message of redemption. The message is the mission. When the mission isn't understood, the messenger moves on. Jesus isn't welcomed in his own town as a prophet. And so he leaves. He leaves in search of a more accepting, a more welcoming place. How could these people, his neighbors, his family, the folks who had watched him grow from childhood, how could they not believe the message he was bringing them? How could the people of Nazareth not understand? They were, after all, overtaxed by Rome, plagued by poverty, bullied, battered. They were a broken people without a solution to their problems. And yet they just couldn't. They just couldn't see God working among them. They had prayed. They had prayed that God's help and deliverance would come to them. But when their prayers were answered, they rejected the answer. How often have we done something similar? Because you see, rejection isn't new to us. I found a few great examples that might remind us that we're really no better off than the people of Nazareth. There are a few of them. You might find them amusing. In 1911, I don't suppose anybody was around in 1911, but in 1911, the French mar Field Marshal Ferdinand Hawk said, airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. Hmm. Henry Ford's lawyer, Horsham Rockman, Rackman, I guess, received advice from a bank president in Michigan. The horse, he said, is here to stay. But the automobile, that's only a novelty. 
Harry Werner, one of the famous Werner brothers said, and I'm quoting him here, so don't yell at me, who the hell wants to listen to actors talk? Who indeed? Daryl Zanuck, head of 20th Century Fox, in 1946 predicted, television will not be able to hold on to any market it captures after, say, six months. People will soon tire of staring at a plywood box every night. Now we stand and stare at these big, gigantic screens, right? I love this one. Popular Mechanics magazine speculated in 1949 that computers would one day only weigh one and a half tons. <laughs> what do you think about that? And here's my favorite. Keith Olson, founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, as late as 1977, boldly stated, there is absolutely no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. How about in their pocket? Yeah. Oops. Well, it seems that rejection of new ideas and innovative ways, innovative ways that look at life and how we live it have been around for a long time. It didn't start with the folks of Nazareth, and it didn't end with them either. Because after his rejection in Nazareth, Jesus gathered his apostles and sent them out, sent them out to teach and to heal and to challenge the people that they met along the way. Jesus told them to take nothing but the essentials with them, and so they went and did as they were told. Diseases were cured, demons were cast out, people were comforted by the message that they brought, God's love was shared, and all in the name of Jesus Christ. People changed, lives changed, the good news was shared, of course, not all believed, but for those that did, God's presence was clear and visible. Even though rejection, God's voice is never silenced. Jesus faced rejection in his hometown, but found a way to keep God's voice speaking through his disciples, through his apostles. And today, we are called to keep God's voice active and speaking through our actions, our thoughts, and our words. God calls ordinary people, ordinary people like us, not because of our skills or our knowledge or even our gifts. God calls us all because we are all needed, needed to share the power that comes to all people through the love and grace and forgiveness of God through the message that Jesus brought to Nazareth and to the world. The message continues today in the bread and the wine of the meal we'll soon share, in the waters of baptism, and in the words of the prophet sitting next to you at the breakfast table, in line at the grocery store, and sitting next to you in the pew this morning. The choice to respond to these life-giving words is ours. And when we do respond, when we pass along the message that Jesus tried to give to the folks in his hometown, when we get the message, we will be able to answer Nathaniel's question. Can anything good come from Nazareth? You betcha it can. Jesus came, and lives and hearts were changed every day. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of all, through the waters of baptism you claim people of all races, ethnicities, and languages as your beloved children. Sustain the baptized and increase their faith that your gospel may be proclaimed throughout the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the heavens, your creating spirit animates the universe. We give you thanks for the moon and the stars, for the planets and the Milky Way galaxy, and for all of the mysteries of the cosmos that remain unknown to us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of freedom, you have liberated us from sin and death and rescue us from all forms of spiritual, social, and political oppression. Defend us from tyrants in our midst and deliver us from all forms of slavery or corruption. Direct our freedom for works of liberation and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of compassion, you became vulnerable in the person of Jesus Christ, in solidarity with the disempowered. Strengthen those who feel faint, give courage to those who fear, and bring wholeness to those in need, especially Shirley Andrus, Colin Hoff, Lois Maloney, Dave Myers, Janet Popowitz, Ann Scott, Gary Scott, Nancy Zola, those with ongoing prayer needs, and those that we name before you now. Christopher, Patrick, Sean. Mm -hmm. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of holiness, you send us out into the world to proclaim your love. We pray for our outreach ministries. Equip us as we leave this place to witness and serve our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. For what else do the people of God pray? God of healing and comfort, wrap your loving arms around the survivors and victims of the building collapse in South Florida. Strengthen them and the first responders as they continue in their journey of, wa of waning hope and impending grief and protect all in the path of Tropical Storm Elsa. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks that in every time and place you call forth prophets who move us toward freedom. Thank you for those who work for human rights, community organizers, and all who strive for liberty for all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. Peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. We share a sign of the Lord's peace with one another from our places for a while longer.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and skies were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred your world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts, of healing his body given up and his victory over death. We await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and on this meal. As grain scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life, your son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. And so gathered into one by that Holy Spirit, let us pray the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. <coughs> as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated now so that you may more easily manage the elements. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for your sins. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, 
we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. Amen. May remain seated for just a couple of announcements. Um, besides all the announcements that are in the bulletin, of which there are a few of some importance, please take a moment to read through them. I don't need to read them to you, I hope. Um, the first one that I want to add is that the first communion class that was scheduled for July 10th has been uh, postponed one week uh, due to my trip that I had not planned on taking to Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, there is also, Pastor G asked me to uh, remind you or to draw your attention to the fact that she put a bulletin board up in the narthex. As you're leaving, it's on the right. It's, I can see it, it's behind Logan, it's blue, and there are some pieces of, uh, little pieces of note paper. She's asking for your ideas and suggestions. You'll see what it says on the bulletin board. Please take a moment to look at that on the way out. Apparently she asked for that, uh, she sent it out electronically, but so far she has only gotten, as my kids would say, crickets. So hopefully there will be some responses soon to, uh, to her questions. Uh, I do want to say that um, thank you to Logan, that was very stirring and beautiful, Logan and, and Mike and Jack, very, very, um, very patriotic. Uh, we are looking forward to August 15th, as you will see that we are having a hymn sing. Uh, I think most of you got your, uh, your summer uh, newsletter, so there is a, uh, some, suggested, some suggested, suggested hymns, so please do that. Um, okay, are there any other announcements for the good of our time and community together? Anybody have anything to add? No? Then please stand for the benediction. I'm sorry? Oh, you know, I always forget that. The sending hymn, and I, this is one that I think everybody would like to sing. So, the sending hymn, my eyes, mine eyes have seen the glory.
peace, you are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.